And at the same time, you've got the bank telling us one set of rules, which is, hey, you should get a loan from us. And the shorter the loan, the lower the interest you'll pay. So we'll even help you out, which makes me suspect, why would the bank charge you less for something that's better than you? What you have to understand is they're in the game of cash flow, but they teach us the game of accumulation. Let's jump in from the comedy side first. So <clears throat> when do you discover that you have this real gift for comedy? And when did you have a feeling that it could truly impact the people around you? The most common thread from both sides of my family was when we had family parties, everybody laughed hard and told jokes. And I would learn the inappropriate jokes from my uncles from the time I was a little kid and then repeat them and get laughs. And, and then it was in college where I, my buddy told me this joke and then I created like this 10, 11 part series off this joke. And when I told my family the first time they were laughing hysterically. So these were not jokes that I totally wrote. They were jokes I modified and took from different places and created this theme out of it. I, that was, I don't know, 1996 when I discovered that. And then I just uh, went to my grandma's 90th birthday a couple months ago, and I had to tell the entire string of jokes. It's all she wanted for her birthday. <laughs> so it really brought some connection with me and my family. Um, and then I really tried it once in front of a crowd impromptu with too much tequila in 2005. I was at a formal financial function in Costa Rica. The jazz band gets done playing, and I just walk up there and start telling jokes that were not funny. People were laughing only because of how bad it was. My wife was embarrassed and exited the room. I'm sure that's not true, but keep it, going with it your humility. Really <laughs> and, um, you know, we can laugh at it, but not because of the jokes, more just because of the train wreck. And then in 2017, in August, I was telling some jokes to my wife at a baseball game. She goes, Where you, where'd you hear those? Those are funny. I'm like, from my own brain. And so that kind of cracked the door open because Ron, she would always say, when I'd say, I think I should do stand-up comedy. She goes, I don't know if you're as funny as you think you are. I'm like, what do you mean? When I'm speaking, people are always laughing. She goes, yeah, you're making them money. They're being, they're being <laughs> kind. She was just like scared for her own, you know, set, uh, self essentially. And then when I finally did my first stand-up set, August of 2017, she was in the front row white knuckling it because she was so not nervous for me nervous for her because the night before I told her some jokes and she goes, I don't know if those are ready for the stage yet. <laughs> yeah, she, uh, she helps me refine all this pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I watched you grab Yannick silver is the head of the group that we were at camp Maverick. And I watched you grab his book and open up the foreword and begin reading and you improv about every single thing. And I don't even think you had much time to prepare. So I'm sure this tour is going to be unbelievable. I'll do, I'll do another preparation today. I did one yesterday, did two, two days, like, and I've, I've already filmed the special. We did it on April 15th. Right. Um, so. I did, I'd only done 33 minutes on stage before that for comedy. And I did uh, three hours and 50 minutes that night. Cause wow. we did three shows and, it's already edited, but now we're going to go prove it out on the road and, and yep. to get Netflix to pick it up. So I can exactly. I was going to say, I have a feeling you're destined for Netflix because that is how good it was that night that I saw you. Thank you. It's just a shame you don't have a great speaking voice or anything. Well, I don't have the singing <laughs> voice you do. You well, know? I don't have that, but uh... somebody had to get a few of the other gifts. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, let's jump to money a little bit here. Money is a subject that tends to bring up fear in people so fast oh. and people contract and we don't want to deal with it. And I don't even want to look and I don't want to even know how much I have in the bank. And so I love listening is how I tend to do books at the, at this time when I'm so busy. I love just talking about the myths around banks and how everybody has just assumed that is the wisest choice. So maybe we can start there with a couple of overview things about how that's not the wisest place for people to have their money. Yeah, and, and let, me, let me break down one thing that'll help create context for this. Yep. So why money feels complicated to people, one of the reasons is because it's a representation of value. It's a storage of value. It's a man-made efficient tool for exchange. And when we look at value, 
Time and effort are not equal in the mind of value. So someone can have a massive amount of impact and money with a lot less time and effort than it might look like for someone that's a physical laborer. And so as we look at that, those dollars, we think, okay, here, I put in this effort, this person put in this effort, but they can go out to 20 restaurants and I go out to one for the same time and effort for where the dollar will go. And it has people feel like it's almost unfair and it's frustrating and they don't almost want to examine it to really see the effectiveness of what they're up to because they don't want to feel bad. And ultimately, far too often, people identify their value based upon how much money they have. And we have to realize it represents value, but it's not why you're valuable. It doesn't determine your destiny or even reflect your potential. Sure, it may mean what access you have to something as far as labor and things, but, but it doesn't tell you like where you're going unless you allow it to. And sometimes people identify themselves based upon their net worth and they think their self-worth is the same thing, which then can create an inflated ego that has people separate themselves from people and therefore diminish the love that they have for themselves and others. And then they just try to keep filling the void with more stuff and more things and more status. And I only speak from personal experience there, Ron. I've been there, I've done it. It, it, it was not as fulfilling as I hoped it would be. And fortunately, I have a strong wife who held a mirror up to my face and said, is it, do you like what you see is this what you want so when we now look at like money as a digital currency that we're now putting in the bank and we've got some statement that has numbers telling us what value is in there it's a little bit tough because first off it's a very moving target even if the number says it's a number it might be worth more or less depending on the day or the country or how much they've added to the computer screens that day and called it printing money and so it might be like we're watering down the soup kind of thing where those numbers don't go quite as far. So that now becomes confusing for people because they have the fear of inflation. They have the fear of like, are they going to have enough money? Is what they're doing valuable enough to make the money that they want? If they have more money, will it make them happier? There's all these questions swirling inside of people's heads. And at the same time, you've got the bank telling us one set of rules, which is, hey, you should get a loan from us and the shorter the loan the lower the interest you'll pay so we'll even help you out which makes me suspect why would the bank charge you less for something that's better than you what you have to understand is they're in the game of cash flow but they teach us the game of accumulation the game of accumulation says set it and forget it invest early often and always you may have heard dollar cost average you're in it for the long haul this is all accumulation and you hear people talk about wealth accumulation but unfortunately People shirk and abdicate responsibility when they, when they accumulate. They hand their money over to a diversified portfolio and they hope and pray for the best that in 30 years or age 65, that it's all gonna work out. But the US Department of Labor came out with some pretty startling statistics that 95% of Americans are not financially independent at age 65. If they stop working, they don't have enough money to handle the bills between Social Security, between a pension, between their retirement plans, between other assets. And it's not because there's a lack of effort. It's because, first off, we underprepare from a standpoint of having liquidity in cash, transferring risk with insurance, setting up the foundation of our finances, and we're taught to skip over that and put money into a tax-favored retirement plan. And here's the thing it's not necessarily as tax favored as people think because saving tax and delaying tax are way different things. One means you don't have to, the other one means you don't have to right now. Because Ron, who doesn't want to wait till they're older and crankier to finally pay their taxes? Delay, I mean, delay the pain. Right, it's the, and this is the neglect that we're taught. The don't think about it, trust the experts. Well, most, most of the experts are well-intentioned salespeople. Most of the experts have no idea what stocks you actually hold and what's going on in the boardrooms of companies and what fees are associated with it that are actually creating drag on your performance. And maybe before you invest that money, you could save on tax and saving tax would put more money in your pocket. Or you could save on interest by renegotiating interest rates or restructuring loans. Or you could save on non-performing fees like legal fees, admin fees, 12B1 fees, expense ratios that aren't performing inside of mutual funds. Or I'm going to interrupt one second. Yeah. Because I know what it's like to hear that roll off of all those terms. When I first started hearing them, I was just like, even that talk overwhelmed me. 
But when you get Garrett's books, you can go at your own pace, okay. one step at a time. Every term is defined. So back to Garrett, but I wanted to reassure my audience because I remember the first time I started hearing him, I go, that's inspiring, but man, am I lost. Overwhelming, yeah. No so, worries, no the worries. The thing is, I just want to help people keep more of what they make first. Plug the financial leaks. Stop tipping the government. Stop overpaying institutions. Stop giving too much money to insurance companies if it's not designed properly. It's about having an elegant design that leads to more safety, protection, and cash flow. And when banks are telling you, hey, fund your retirement plan with our little retirement division here. Hey, put extra money into your mortgage because that improves their cash flow. Like they have a different set of rules. Their entire rules are, hey, if you get a loan, I just got a loan on this home, you have to make a down payment. If you don't make a big enough down payment, they charge you private mortgage insurance, which is insurance for them. They made me get two appraisals on the property, which I paid for to protect them. They want to see my taxes. They want to see my credit score. They wanted to you know, know what the value of the home was with that appraisal that I mentioned. And so these are all ways that they manage risk and then they create cash flow. They're not saying, hey, we'll just give you this money and you owe us something in 30 years from today. They get money along the way. So cash flow is more important than accumulation. Want to master your money? Want to figure out the things that you could do to improve your finances? Click here and check out more videos like this on Money Matters.